Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I posted, I was, uh, I, I don't know where everybody else was at, but about one o'clock yesterday, I lost all productivity in my day. Um, I, I watched the news live and I, and I mean this like with all, like uh, there's a heaviness, but I haven't watched the news live like that since the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, so it's been a while. Uh, and I really, I struggled with like during the time I'm watching all this, my brain was, uh, I was on Twitter watching these tweets come in and I'm watching live news and every once in a while in a, tw in the Twitter feed, a, a tweet from a business or a company or even an individual that was clearly scheduled ahead of time would pop into my feed. And, and some people that I know and, and respect are all commenting on the same thing, which is like, you, you've got to jump in and, and, and stop your scheduled stuff. And this is not the time to talk about business or, or whatever. And, and that's something that when I lead a workshop on social media, I talk a lot about that. Um, there's been significant events throughout our history where it's just not appropriate. And so as I woke up this morning, I was really wrestling with the idea of, is it appropriate to have business brew today? And so I'll just read what I posted this morning and we'll take the conversation from there. But essentially I said, we recognize that yesterday was a difficult day for America and without intending to be insensitive or dismissive, we made the decision to proceed with business brew this morning. The conversation will be about leading with emotional intelligence, which seems timely and appropriate. And so before I jump into introducing our speaker, I also want to comment and just say, with all sincerity, we, I decided to do this this morning knowing that it's a, it's, yesterday was difficult and, and hard, and I don't know that this morning is going to be any easier. And to also say that um, this is a safe, a safe space. This is a place where anyone can come from all walks of life. And, and I don't care what your pronoun, pronouns are, what your, the color of your skin is. This is a place that's safe for you as a guest. And I sincerely hope that this is a space that is safe for our speakers. Um, we always entertain conversation and it has almost always been, uh, I think, nice and uh, well-intentioned. So I just wanna set that tone for this morning as we dive in. Uh, one more quick little note, if you're joining us on Facebook, would love your comments and uh, you can use the thread on Facebook to comment, ask questions of our guest. If you are live here with us on Zoom, you are welcome to use the chat function to, to join us uh, in the conversation. You're also welcome to ask a question live if you would like, uh, just kind of wave at me and let me know or use the chat to let me know. Uh, and without further ado, I've done way too much talking than I wanted to do. I want to reintroduce my friend, David Sloan. David is a professor at Whitworth University, and he joined us in November to start a conversation about leading with emotional intelligence. And I have to be brutally honest, I've had a lot of guests over the years. And David was the first guest who, without fail, everyone asked to come back. So I had, apparently we either didn't get enough of the conversation done or uh, the conversation was so engaging that uh, people wanted more. And David, I had a chance to watch the last few minutes so we can pick up where we left off. You were right in the middle of a conversation about how when you're in a relationship with somebody and it can be an interpersonal relationship on a personal level, it could be a friend or a spouse or a family member, or it could be somebody that you engage with at work on a professional level, you're eventually going to cause harm to that person or they're eventually going to cause harm to you and there's a way to apologize that doesn't just allow them to know that you, you didn't mean it and that you're sorry, but also allows them space to say what they need to say, as difficult as it might be for you to receive that. So I don't know if you want to pick that up or if you know where that takes you next, but uh, David, thank you so much for joining us on what uh, has the potential to be a pretty difficult and weird morning. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, there's... There's a lot of heaviness today, I think, probably for, for everybody. So great to see you, Mark. Uh, so now I have, we're in a business brew where I have two of my favorite guest speakers in the classroom. Mark comes and uh, talks in my uh, capitalism and wealth discussion group sometimes uh, here at Whitworth, and it's so amazing. And um, so I feel 
just really honored to be here with with all of you. Um, can we could we do kind of something like we did last time instead of just jumping right in? Could I could I ask that we maybe go around, uh, introduce ourselves, and then maybe just kind of to set the intention. Let's can we let's let's do a personal question. Can we describe our most memorable meal? So maybe just a quick introduction of yourself and a, a description of your most the, the most memorable meal that you've ever had. Absolutely. So uh, thank you for reminding. I always try to do introductions and I just got lost and caught up in the craziness. Uh, I do want to really point out uh, just super quick, Emily, Gretchen and Bill have all joined us on Facebook and all made their presence known. And we have quite a few folks on Facebook. So good morning to all of you joining us on Facebook. And so David, I'll facilitate and then just go through my list. Dorothy, uh, introduce yourself and then remind us or tell us of your favorite meal. There we go. Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Dorothy Zevenbergen and I am the owner of Cultivate Consulting. And memory favorite meal would probably have to be my birthday meal for the last couple of years. And that is uh, kumpa, which is um, a Norwegian. Uh, my great grandmother used to make it and it's a potato and meat dish that us Norwegians like to partake in. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. All right, we have two Marks. So we'll go with Mr. Odegaard because he's the one who shows up first. Good morning, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, lucky, lucky in that sense. Um, yeah, Mark Odegaard worked for Measurement Consulting. We focus on uh, sustainability consulting, uh, helping companies improve their social impact and reduce their environmental impact. Um, I would say the the, I have a lot of memorable meals, but the one that goes furthest back is um, purple rice and fried crickets in uh, China. It was actually all of it was really good too. <laughs> wow. Wow. <Hey. laughs> Thanks, Mark. Okay, and now on to Mark number two. Not that that is any less significant than the first Mark, but Mr. Terrell, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Oh, we don't hear you quite yet. Not yet. You are unmuted, I can tell you that much. No, hey, Mark, we'll double back to you uh, and let you get a, a chance to sort some things out. And if, if we can't get it going, uh, feel free to jump in chat and let us know what's going on with you. Uh, uh, Robert Rowley, good morning, how are you? Good morning, my friend, uh, Robert Rowley. I'm a, a real estate and business attorney in downtown uh, Spokane. Uh, I like Mark. I was over in China with the family a few years ago. Uh, I was going to talk about one of the things that my son would always eat that uh, probably is not a good mixed company. But uh, uh, in uh, Shen, China, we went to see the uh, Terracotta Warriors and they had this uh, dish that it was a uh, cold, it was a breakfast. It was like a cold noodle vinegar uh, meat type of uh, breakfast and that stuff was like crack. I couldn't get enough of that stuff. Uh, I discovered that there's like one restaurant over in uh, Seattle. So someday he and I are going to go there to get it. So very good stuff. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I will go. I'm last, I guess. And before we kick it off with our guest, my name is Josh King, uh, the managing member at Tinderbox Marketing. And uh, if you're not aware, I am the facilitator of Business Brew. And I've been thinking about this the whole time and I can't quite come. I, there's two that I'll share and I'll just share the one. I was not particularly close with one of my grandfathers. His name was Earl King. And for most of my childhood, he lived here in Spokane while I lived uh, in various other places around the state. And I do remember uh, he took us to a really fancy restaurant. It was just me and him and my, my brother. And he ordered escargot. And when he told us what it was, I was just so uh, flabbergasted that uh, I tried it. And I, I don't know, I, I, people might love it. I thought it just literally tasted like dirt. Um, and then my kid, we, there's, a, there's a, a sports bar in Chihuahua where I ended up grow, spending the latter half of my uh, youth. And there's a, that, that sports bar has the occasion, like occasionally serves escargot as well. My mom ordered it. And so my kids then ended up trying it as well. 
So I don't know how snail ended up being something that we've all somehow tried, but I would say snail has to be one of the most memorable things I've ever eaten. Awesome. Mark, do you want to see if your mic works real quick? Work? Oh, yeah. Work? Oh, oh, good. I'm Mark Carroll, and um, I used to work at an organization called Cup of Cool Water, but now I am a spiritual director at another organization that I started called Your Story in a Flashlight. Um, and so I've been doing that for a couple of years now. Um, my favorite meal would have to be, um, I don't know, more, more memorable, I would say, is we took our kids, we used to take our kids backpacking. They're grown now, but they were like 10 and 12. And we were going to one of my favorite places on the Pacific Crest Trail. We were hiking into it and it just started raining like crazy. So much so that the trail just became the stream. And so we decided to turn around and there, we're just soaked. We decided to turn around try it the next weekend. So we're on our way out and we decide we're going to go to this, we go to Clean Elum at this Mexican restaurant, soaking wet, like we were just totally drenched. And then we tried it the next weekend and uh, the same trail and the exact same thing happened. And so we repeated the Mexican restaurant. It was awesome. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for oh. sharing. Thanks, Mark. I do want to jump in. Emily on Facebook shared that her grandma makes the best cornbread. And it was always a treat at her house, warm and dripping with butter and hum honey. And Emily is the client engagement manager at Bernardo Wills Architect. So thank you, Emily, for sharing that with us this morning. All right, Mr. Sloan, we're off to the races. Do you want to share your favorite meal or most memorable meal? Well, yeah. So uh, if the reason I thought about this question uh, was because I think where we finished off last was, yeah, that four steps framework to forgiveness that... Um, that I actually learned from my mentor, his name is Shan Furch. And, um, and so just as a reminder of those four steps, you say what you did. And then the second step is actually asked about the impact. How'd that make you feel when I raised my tone of voice at you? Something like that. And then step three is you actually ask for forgiveness for the behavior. You know, will you forgive me for raising my tone of voice at you? And then also for the impact. So if, if I, if Mary and I had, if I raised my tone of voice at Mary and she felt like I belittled her in doing that, I would also ask for forgiveness for belittling her. Even though that wasn't my intention, that was my, that was the impact. And then, and then of course the fourth step is to actually change. And that could be simply being more mindful intentionally about certain behaviors or, or it could be setting up systems of accountability if, if it ends up becoming a chronic behavior that continuously harms your beloved. But what I was thinking about for my most memorable meal, so Mary's cousin, uh, when she got, when he got married, him and his wife now, like, got this crazy opportunity to get married um, in Rome, in St. Peter's, like in the Basilica, like actually in the Vatican. Um, it was like watching royalty. Uh, get married. It was amazing. Um, and so the rehearsal dinner was probably my most memorable meal. Mary and I were in a fight because we couldn't find it. Um, we're just wandering around Rome. We're like an hour and a half late to the rehearsal dinner. And so like, there's all these stress and anxiety and, um, and we finally found it. We did, we both asked, we both did the four steps with each other. And then it was the most amazing dinner ever. We were brought into this restaurant that had seemed like a secret door that took us down this winding staircase to this like brick basement restaurant where they were cooking baking uh fresh bread bringing it right to the table and you know just it just was a, a wonderful experience it's funny i don't really remember so much about the food other than the bread um and then the, the conversations uh there was her wife's family had a uh, had some cut her Mary's cousin's new wife um they had some cousins who were there were twins and they were deaf and they were sitting at the end of the table with us and that was when I had like my iPad my iPod touch this is back when before smartphones really but we just we were able to communicate because we were just passing the touch back and forth because it was too dark to write notes and so we just had a really nice time and we even had some you know some letters back and forth after that so 
well it was like the the food itself is it wasn't i mean it were, probably was amazing but it was more the experience the atmosphere um the relationships that was memorable for me so uh i just thought yeah but it's a, it was a good thing that we asked for forgiveness before going in there because we were able to kind of like it kind of gave us a reset you know and then then we were able to have a really nice time um so maybe before jumping back in, I can kind of paraphrase a little bit what we talked about last time. Does that sound all right? Just um, so if you don't mind, am I allowed to share the screen? I think I am. So it should be. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just, I won't run a PowerPoint this whole time, but I'll just use this as like a visual cue. So just as a reminder, emotional intelligence is the ability to identify and manage your own emotions as well as the emotions of others. It's different from intellectual intelligence. Um, and, you know, we break it down into five different <clears throat> pieces. And we talked last time, I think, about self-awareness and empathy, I believe. Maybe we talked about, we also talked about self-regulation. So self-awareness being the ability to recognize and understand your own moods and your own emotions and, and drives as well as their effect on other people and so that forgive that second step in the forgiveness framework has to do with some self-awareness is like asking for what's the impact um self-regulation is our ability to control or redirect our own disruptive impulses and and also moods so it's just it's with with other people it's it's our ability to suspend judgment or or to think before acting basically um motivation which we didn't talk about that one yet um but it's it's the passion to work for reasons that basically go beyond the paycheck but, or status so it's it's motivation in terms of is yeah, the ability, how likely are you to pursue your goals with energy and persistence? And it's not usually just money driven. Empathy, we spent, I think, a lot of time on empathy last time. The ability to understand the emotional makeup of other people. Um, people who are em empathetic have skill in treating people according to their emotional reactions. And we talked about a little bit about a lot of kind of what inspires me to look at emotional intelligence is um kind of my driving philosophy of servant leadership and empathy is one of the 10 characteristics of servant leadership and then um the last is social skill and its proficiency in managing relationships and building networks so people who have social skill you know they're very persuasive they they have an ability to find common ground um and build rapport so um one of the things i think maybe that would be worth um, revisiting. I'm gonna try to sh stop share here. Um, I've lost my Zoom. Oh, here we go, stop share. Okay. Um, one of the things that I thought might be um, pertinent to this morning um, is uh, to talk about, so we talk about relationships in terms of systems. And when we, you know, oftentimes we wanna treat a symptom, but not the underlying root or cause. But when there is, when there's chronic anxiety in a system, oftentimes I think we are just swept up by the game and we, and we can't step out of it until we can name patterns that are going on. Um, so I would say like, can I just start with kind of helping us talk through, um, I think, cause you can look at signs or characteristics of chronically anxious systems. And once we can name those things, then you can not be swept up by them. And I think they happen interpersonally, but I think they also happen at a societal level. So, and I think when we talk through these five characteristics, maybe we'll see um, some of these things happening right now. So, yeah, I, David, I think that that's, I, I would love to talk about that because as you were saying that, I, I just can't help but reflect on times where I've, I've been in those work environments 
and the challenge that I've personally experienced is where the leadership thrives in those kinds of systems when there's constant anxiety. Another word for that might be pressure or, um, you know, there's always a deadline or there's always a fire and there's always a thing. And so the leadership thrives on that anxiety and that, that, but the team doesn't. And so it's almost as if either the leadership doesn't recognize that it's an issue or it's not an issue to them. So they don't care that it's an issue. So I don't know if you're, you're what you were going to discuss walks through that, but I like you, you said something about anxious systems and that's immediately where my brain went is like, I've worked in that and it wasn't awesome. And how do you like if, and then also, I guess another PS to that would be if you are an employee in that, what are the steps you should go through to either address that with the leadership or is it just time to jump ship and move somewhere else? Yeah, that's really good. So thank you for, yeah, thanks for being willing for me to like, because, and I don't have a PowerPoint for this, but if, if you like notes, like I, I can share screen and just kind of type up what I was going to say. Uh, here, let me see if I can do this again and just do uh, this one. So I, it's kind of like, I'm kind of treating this like a virtual whiteboard here. So one of the, probably the first characteristic of a chronically anxious system is what we call reactivity. And that's just simply vicious cycle of intense reactions between members of a, a relationship system. Um, so examples of reactivity would be interrupting, uh, you know, finishing other people's sentences, um, constantly making <clears throat> making things personal. I mean, we're all guilty of this, um, especially when you're in conflict. Somebody could say something like, "I love you," and then, but even that could be suspect if you if there's like a lack of trust in that moment. Um, other signs of reactivity are. Uh, labeling like you statements. And that those are all oftentimes coupled with absolute statements. You are always late. You never get your work done in a, in a timely manner or you always, you know, you, you can think of a thousand examples, but those, those, those would be signs of reactivity. Um, the disappearance of playfulness. Like just an overly serious um, like atmosphere or mood. Could we actually, can I just ask you, have you ever been, has anybody in this Zoom room ever been a part of a stressful situation and then just you saw that somebody was, just somebody used a little playfulness and it just saved the day. Could anybody share an example of, of that playing out? I can think of, I mean, just yesterday, um, we were trying to get our kids to do their math homework. And um, <clears throat> I mean, it was so funny because we were, you know, my son Edson, he's seven, he's in second grade and there was like tunnel vision on, it was difficult and it wasn't fun. And, um, and, and we, we decided just like, hey, let's do three somersaults and then see what happens. And it like, just kind of snapped the tunnel vision out. I mean, it was like a little bit of body play. There was a little bit of like, you know, squealing, you know, and it really, there, it had nothing to do with the math homework, but it just like kind of snapped, snapped us out of a, out of a kind of a gridlock there. I can think of times when, uh, when I was overly serious, maybe I came home from work and, um, had a had a rough day or something was on my mind or and or maybe I had like tasks to do around the house and 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 Mary 
would try to dance like a like a dinosaur in front of me and I was like oh yeah like this is that was funny and we really need to remember that you know it like kind of breaks us breaks us out of uh you know like a reactivity type of a situation it would be it'd be really nice if you guys do think of examples to to share because I don't I don't love to I don't love to talk the whole time oh go ahead Mark yeah I I was having, I know it's happened to me, but I was having trouble thinking of one, but um, the one that came to mind is uh, when my kids were younger, like three and eight or whatever. Um, and I, there were a few times where I got really angry and was shouting at them. And then they just bust up laughing because it seemed so out of character uh, in their mind for me to be doing it and just so ridiculous. And as soon as they start laughing, then it's really, was really difficult for me to, to stay angry. Um, but I've found that kids are always really good at that, either at pointing out your own hypocrisy or, or yeah. just doing something because they don't know how else to react. And then it, it completely shifts the, the dynamic. And like you say, it, it kind of takes your brain out of a, um, <clears throat> off the tracks and, and uh, helps you refocus. So. That's, uh, that just made me think of um, <clears throat> just like your, your whole kind of attitude changed when, when your kids were laughing. And I wonder, there's like there's part of our brain that operates we have these mirror neurons that like we tend to like copy what we see in other people so today i would say is a very heavy day so i intentionally we have to you know when i'm not in my office you know policy at whitworth is we wear masks and um even if we're outside and uh and so in order to kind of cheer up people who um, are around me i i decided to bring this mask Because I feel like even if I have a frown on my face, um, you can't not, you might not be able to look, but you can't not like, at least it changes something, right? Um, we have mirror neurons and that's why when people smile at us, it makes us happier. It's really good. Thanks, Mark. When, uh, so I have an example. So I, I had some weird jobs growing up, but um, I also worked for some weird managers and, and one of them was actually my stepdad. And uh, so I worked at the rental shop up at 49 degrees north and um, in the evenings, you know, about three o'clock rentals would start coming back in. And it, you'd get like, everybody just comes back at once and you have all these ski boots and all these skis. And it could be a really kind of like a tense situation, especially if you had somebody who'd brought, you know, it always seemed to happen that on the busiest day, somebody got hurt. And so when somebody gets hurt on rental gear, you have to test the gear and ensure, and there's all this paperwork to make sure that it wasn't the gear that caused the problem. And even if they're like, I know it wasn't the gear, you still have to do this paperwork. And so um, there, my stepdad would do this thing where he would take the Offspring album that had Pretty Fly for a white guy and he would put it on and he'd play it almost so loud you couldn't talk but it just like that song is so like it hasn't aged well but if you play that song <laughs> now it's so silly and it would it would be this hyper energy where we would just it kind of it would knock off the seriousness of you know all the boots and everything and you look back I look back and I go like how serious was it putting boots away but you know I was an 18 year old kid and at the time it seemed like, oh, this is the most stressful thing I've ever done is there's, you know, 20 pair of boots that need to be put away. But he just had this way of doing that. And then it would encourage his team. And one night it was returns were coming in and then they also had night skiing. So you had returns coming in and then you had new rentals going out. And I don't, it's, I, is it, I don't know what the, the convent is or the nunnery is, but the nuns that are in Spokane would come skiing and they loved going on night skiing nights because it was free. You just had to bring two cans of food and then it was free. And so these nuns are coming and this one guy, Lucas, this music is playing and the nuns are there. And I'm kind of like, is this the right music to be playing with nuns in the rental shop? And this guy, Lucas is helping them get their gear off. And he says out loud for like everyone to hear, watch me as I attempt to remove this boot from this nun, like he was a magician and the nuns laughed and everybody laughed. And it was like all of a sudden the tension in the rental shop with the people coming in and the people like it all just left. And then it just reminded me that like, I don't know how much experience you have with nuns, but they're people too. And they have the most wonderful sense of humor. 
I just, my draw, I was like, he did not just make a nun joke. And then like, they just, they, they, it, it was so great. So that was those, like, I think about that a lot, like how music, but then also just creating an environment where people are allowed to have fun, even if you're not the one bringing fun, right? Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. So, you know, a little play, when, if we define reactivity as like a vicious cycle of intentions, reactions, uh, and, and intense reactions, you know, playfulness, a little playfulness can be like medicine in that, in that moment. Um, I'm going to share this screen again here. Actually, while you're doing that, Emily just shared on Facebook, she said, in a stressful situation, someone opening up and being playful is vulnerable, but can help break down some walls and others. So I thought that just tags right on to what you were just saying, David. Yeah. And that's not to say that every, you know, a joke is always appropriate, right? But oftentimes, oftentimes, we, when, when there's a disappearance of the playfulness, like where playfulness is impossible because we're so gridlocked and reactive, um, that's a sign of reactivity. Um, okay, uh, other examples of reactivity would be um, shutting down, you know, um, criticizing, uh, blaming. David, could you do me a favor and just toggle your Zoom on your Word doc on the bottom right so that we, it just will show up a little bit better on Facebook and for those of us who may have. What am I eyes. doing? So the, the Zoom that where you have your plus minus on your Word doc down on the bottom right, if you'll just make your, make your Word. Oh, just make it bigger? Yeah, beautiful, wonderful, thank you. Um, and when we look at reactivity, you know, you can see that some of these are more, uh, some of these are more kind of aggressive behaviors and some of them are more um, like self-preserving types of behaviors. So reactivity can, can, can show itself both from, like can come from both the fight or flight part of our, our brain. Um, another, one other example of uh, reactivity is hyper insecurity. So that's like fishing for compliments a lot um, would be an example. So when you, so it's, I mean, all I'm, all I'm doing by giving these examples is just to say, hey, you know, if somebody's interrupting a lot, it, it, that's a sign that there's some reactivity in this system. Somebody's, you know, if, if somebody's blaming a lot or criticizing a lot, that's just a sign that we need to, we can take steps to kind of reduce the reactivity in the system. Um, a second, and one other uh, thing to note about reactivity is that the, the very calmness of, in one often creates more reactivity in others. Because oftentimes, if, if we are differentiated and calm in the midst of reactivity, they, others can perceive that calmness to be a lack of concern and, con and confuse reactivity with passion. Looks like Mr. Odegaard had a, uh, something to say. Sure. Yeah, just a, just a quick question. Quick question. I think I know the answer to this, um, but is it, so when I see system, I think of, you know, larger group. So if it's a group of people, then that there's anxiety within how things are going. Is it, is it always that, or is it sometimes just that a single individual has a certain degree of anxiety and then is, uh, um, you know, their reactions is just based on their own, um, I don't know, based on themselves versus what's happening in the larger group. Um, that is a great question. So, um, what, it, and you said, you think you may have the answer. What, it, what's your thoughts? What's your thoughts? Uh, well, I, my, my answer was that it could be either. Like, it just depends on the situation and that there are some anxious people who are always going to, or maybe more likely to be reactive. <clears throat> and then there are other instances where the group dynamic is, you know, there's enough anxiety because of a, the nature of a conversation or something that then can cause people who might not otherwise be reactive to be reactive. Um, so anyway, that was, that was my thought there. So that's, yeah, that's really good. Um, so one of what my, in terms of, so I, I teach at Whitworth, I teach leadership management and marketing, but my, my real passion, my real kind of area of emphasis or research is applying family systems theory to organizational contexts. 
And one of the people I study is this guy named Murray Bowen. And he he's the person who kind of figured out that about family systems. And um, he made the argument that the that the the basic relationship system is not actually a dyad, it's a triad. And we can, so in a, a relationship triangle. And um, and that um, there can be healthy triangles and unhealthy triangles, but if there's anxiety, it tends to move. A, a, it's not static just in one individual. It tends to move around um, oftentimes within a relationship system. Um, I think that there are probably, I think you're right that there probably is some stuff that's like just inherent. I might, I might have a physical ailment that causes me anxiety that's like, you know, like maybe I twisted my ankle. I mean, that's, that, that could be like inherent or I might even have like some kind of chemical imbalance or something like that. Um, of, well, what, what I'm talking about is like more anxious systems. So that could be a relationship system, could be a family, it could be a workplace, it could be as big as society as at the societal level as well. It's really good. Good, okay, so the next, kind of of the, the second of the five characteristics of chronically anxious systems would be um, hurting. And this is what made me think about this is, you know, I feel like we're seeing a lot of hurting um, in society um, where <clears throat> forces of togetherness are stronger than the forces for individuality. Um, where you see <clears throat> people who are, have this like stuck togetherness, like a cult. Mm -hmm. um, where we value peace over progress, comfort over novelty. Um, in when when there's hurting, you'll see a lot of lots of either or thinking, or black and white, um, all or nothing type of type of thinking. Um, People would say, so um, examples of like historic examples of hurting um, at the societal level would probably be like um, Nazi Germany would be one example where uh, there was, uh, there was, everyone adapts to the least mature members of a system. And because of fear, we're un unwilling to um, uh, do what we think is right. So that like peace over pro comfort over novelty or progress. Um, the third characteristic of chronically anxious systems is blame displacement. And that's related to reactivity as well. But becoming a victim rather than taking responsibility for our own being and destiny. Um, you know, at a very, very basic level, we could say, you made me mad, but that's not true. I made, I, I'm responsible for my own emotional well-being and destiny. And that has to do, that relates with self-regulation and self-awareness. If I am mad, why am I mad really? Like you may have said something that triggered my anger, but that anger was already mine. It belongs to me, if, if that makes sense. Um, the fourth is just a quick fix mentality. Um, which is addressing a symptom rather than a fundamental change. Oftentimes we, we, we go for a quick fix mentality because we have a low threshold for discomfort. Um, does anybody have an example of seeing a quick fix mentality in a in a in an anxious system go ahead dorothy well uh in my previous employment before i started my business um the organization that i worked with um was very much into quick fixes like they would like quickly diagnose what was the problem get an answer like get four people in a room say okay what's the next step we need to do do it instead of really 
taking the time to really go through the process of of figuring out what the root cause was. And even when they switched to a system or tried to switch to a system, right? They're changing their culture into trying to do the root causes. It was really hard um, for the individuals who had already been wanting the quick fix um, to be able to adapt and learn the new system. Um, and so even when we went through classes, some of them were still like, let's just get to the point. I'm, I'm tired of learning this. Let's just get to the point. So um, yeah, that's my example. It, it, it was very interesting watching them try to change a culture. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. So <clears throat> I've observed this happen, but I want to share a story. So just recently, uh, towards the end of 2020, I was uh, approached by a, a pretty large local business. And, and I'm not going to say the name, but if, if I did, you would all very much know it. And they were looking for help with some strategic planning. And it was weird because while I do like business plans and social media strategies for my clients, like I wouldn't, I don't know that I would ever say I've done a strategic plan, but they were referred to me and they really wanted to meet with me. So we did a, a Zoom call. And in the call, I was asking lots of questions like, what have you done? Where are you at? And it became, eventually the CEO said uh, that they, every so often they'll do, they'll do some planning work, but then the, the follow through is, is, is lacking. And I, and I said, okay, so, so tell me about that. Um, what, why doesn't it get followed through? And, and they said to me when, when, I, when, they, when we were emailing before the Zoom that they wanted a, they wanted a living document. And so I said, okay, what are the challenges that you've run into in the past in, in adding, you know, changing your direction or, or executing a strategic plan? And then tell me what you want. Like, what is a living document? And, and they basically said, somebody jumped in and said, well, we, we just have a, a hard time with like accountability. Like we create these plans and there's a lot of energy, but then no one really knows who's doing what. And I said, so what do you want from me? Like, how can I, how, how, how do we change that? What does a living document mean to you? And they, their answer was, well, it means what we said. It just, it's a living document. And I, I, it was, I, I, I didn't quite understand. What, and it became very clear later that, so I, I, I put together this proposal that was gonna be like five days of really digging in and building a plan. But part of that was gonna be assigning who's gonna do what, and then also creating the accountability systems not as a way to you know hold people's feet to the fire make people feel bad but as a way to encourage and motivate and we're all sharing this vision and it uh, suffice it to say i didn't land the gig and i and i and as i was complaining to my wife she said i don't think that they really wanted what they said they wanted and so my experience was like this is a system that knows it's got a problem but also at the same time doesn't want to fix and so I looked at that as like directly related to the CEO's ability to lead that team. Like they say they want these things, but then when it, when the rubber was ready to hit the road, they just really didn't. Um, and so I responded and I said in an email, I said, I, 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 you know, I'm really bummed, but I'm not surprised. It was a super awkward zoom and I knew that. So I took my responsibility. I said, I, I didn't bring my A game and I apologize for that. And then I said, I really hope though that you'll look at, the framework that I provided, because I really do think it can solve some of the problems that you 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 confessed to me, and I didn't I didn't even hear back to that. So it was like they were that guy pushed some button <laughs> that they weren't ready to address. You know, that's good though. I mean, it looks like sounds like it 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 would have been a terrible experience for you to work try to do that project. You wouldn't have really got very far. Um, yeah, those are great, both really great examples. Um, you know, quick fix mentality, let's get four people in a room and solve the problem, or let's hire a consultant to, so that we can show that we, show that we're like doing our due diligence. Um, and, and just the, the insight about quick fix mentality is, it usually comes from our, disc, our inability to sit in an uncomfortable situation. It's our, it's our low threshold for discomfort. Sometimes discomfort's important and, and that's what breeds the insight. But if we, if, we, if we have no tolerance for it, then we'll just throw a solution at, at a problem that we haven't even really clearly defined. So that's good. Um, the, the, the fifth, um, the, 
The fifth tenet or characteristic of chronically anxious systems. Am I sharing the same screen? Uh, let's see here. Is that what you're seeing? I see your desktop. Oh. <laughs> Golden. I've got a couple different. I have, when I have my laptop open, uh, it changes the order of moving my mouse from one monitor to another monitor. And so I'm always going right when I should be going left. Um, the last one, and this one could use some probably explanation, and it relates to everything else, is undifferentiated leadership. Um, undifferent, so differ, differentiation of self is probably the topic that I research the most, and it, and it simply refers to your ability to maintain a separate sense of self while still being present with others in an anxious system without being like totally fused to the system or, or cut off, you know, we, I can maintain a different sense of self and, but I can also just like cut myself off completely. I can leave the room or, or not talk about the issue, or I could be re hyper, hyper reactive, overly critical. Um, and, and undifferentiated leadership just means you're more emotionally cut off, you're more reactive, probably more likely to have like what we call like ego fusion, where uh, my moods are so closely tied to yours that you know that it, you get this bullwhip effect. Um, you walk in and you have a sad look on your face that totally changes my mood. Um, and um, and then the other thing, undifferentiated leadership is less able to speak from the I position. So a lot more of those you statements and probably a lot more, um, a lot more uh, blaming and absolute statements. Um, also in relationship to those like relational triangles that we're talking about, you know, there's healthy triangles and there's unhealthy triangles, toxic triangles. And if you have undifferentiated leadership that you're more likely to triangle um, somebody in. So for example, um, triangling in would be, you know, the classic family triangle is, okay, let's, let's pretend that Josh is, is Mark's dad, Mark Terrell's dad. And, you know, Mark Terrell and Josh have a great relationship. Um, you know, growing up and then around Mark Terrell's 12 or 13th year, he's exploring um, some of the freedoms, like not being inappropriate in, in any major way, but there's some tension that happens between Josh and, and Mark. But perhaps, so maybe Dorothy is the mom in this situation and she's now all of a sudden has anxiety because this, this relationship that she's loved so much, she's seen it kind of fall apart and all she wants to do is fix it for them. Um, and so she's constantly, you know, brokering um, compromises between Mark and Josh. Um, and Josh is always complaining to Dorothy about how Mark's now irresponsible. He used to be a great kid, but, and, and Mark's complaining to Dorothy about uh, how, how Josh is like so naggy all the time. And um, so that's like the classic family triangle where we see, you know, the anxiety that belongs to Josh and Mark, they're giving it to Dorothy and they're trying to triangle her in. Um, well, that happens in the workplace too. And that happens in societies and all this stuff. Um, <laughs> and um, if you have undifferentiated leadership, you're more likely to, to triangle in other people. So if I have conflict, uh, let's say I have conflict with with Josh, I might talk to Mark about Josh and say, don't you agree, Mark, that Josh is irresponsible? Like, don't you agree with me? Aren't you on my side? That's, that would be kind of the, the workplace triangle. It happens in a family too. Undifferentiated leadership is more likely to triangle in that way. So I'm giving Mark the anxiety that, will, that belongs to Josh and me. And all that does, and what happens when the anxiety gets more intense, um, it can't be withheld in, a, in an original triad. So then we end up with 
interlocking triangles, more triangles get brought into it to, to, to diffuse the, the anxiety. Um, so when, when we can, now that we, so we've got reactivity, hurting, blame, displacement, quick fix mentality and undifferentiated leadership. We know how to like, what the examples are of that. And we know how to see those. And I mean, what are, are we seeing any of those in our, I mean, we've, we're talking about families and, and workplaces, but are we seeing any of those symptoms of chronically anxious systems in, in our society right now? I mean, maybe, I, I don't know if we want to like talk about all the examples, but. I, I think we could safely just say without getting into one side or the other that the political arena is a place full of, of this kind of thing. And I would say, I would argue that you see that on our local level here mm -hmm. and, and you see it maybe even a regional level and then certainly at a national level. Um, so without digging into that too much, I think we're all nodding in agreement <laughs> because we're in the wake of that right now. I do wanna point out a couple of things real quick as we're thinking on this. Uh, Kara from Facebook has been jumping in. Um, so has Becky. Uh, unfortunately, their comments are coming because Facebook's on a delay. So their comments come a little bit late to the conversation. It's not their fault, it's just the delay. Uh, but then Dorothy also said just a few minutes ago, as you were talking about these, you know, the triangle or the triad, she said, so are you saying you need to have a good set of boundaries and leading from within so you as a leader can lead rather than be a part of the problem? And I think that that's, I mean, I know, David, your plan isn't just to leave us with these broken systems and then say, okay, good luck. Uh, I know you, you plan to give us the tools we need. Um, but I think Dorothy's kind of teeing that up, that we're seeing these systems play out in the real world. We might be seeing them in our own personal lives um, and, and maybe maybe a key to, to, to sorting through this is to have a really good set of boundaries that you start with and then go from there. Absolutely, yeah. The, uh, I would say that, that self-regulation is pretty much founded on your ability to set those clear set of healthy boundaries, right? Not so, unhealthy boundaries would be cut off, right? But healthy boundaries is, I actually know where I stop and you begin. There's a difference, like it's not fused, right? And if we have a healthy set of boundaries, so now when we see reactivity in organizations, self-regulation is one of the best way to heal the imbalance. Um, I, I, we, we've, we've said this before, but you can, you know, you can't change anybody else in the world but yourself. But when you change yourself, those who are in your relationship systems can't stay the same. It's impossible. It's a psychological law. Um, if I walk into the room, one example, like all of a sudden with a bunch of playfulness and you guys are in my relationship system, you can't stay the same. I can't make you change in a specific way, but it's impossible. Um, so having that self-regulation, the ability to control and redirect our own disruptive impulses and moods um, is one way to heal the imbalance. It's the, so, the ability to sp suspend judgment and to think before acting. Um, so when we find ourselves in a position that requires tough decisions, I would say tough decisions are decisions that are painful for some, right? If I have resources that I need to give to different constituents and that decision by, by its nature means that some parties get those resources and others don't, that's a painful decision for some people. So that's, makes it, that's what makes it a tough um, decision. Um, to lead with conviction, to act boldly, to take clear stands and be willing to take risk is what that looks like. Um, even when it makes you vulnerable to failure and ridicule. If you make a, if you have to make a tough decision, it's gonna, pro you can expect reactivity and sabotage. Um, but there's two things that you can do. Um, and one is drawing on your core values. And I know Josh, you've talked a lot about um, like start like you're finding your why and things like that. Like what, why is it that the, that you do what you do? What are your core values? Um, it, and it, 
it might be scary, but focusing on your core values um, or a future that you care about gives you the courage. Um, did I talk about the story last time about when I was first hired um, at Whitworth? And maybe I didn't. Um, okay, I'm gonna just be as like anonymous as I can here. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you did, so fire away if you have. I mean, there's enough new people on the conversation that, yeah. Well, um, so once when I was a new hire, I was I was being considered as like a, a rising star. I was building a reputation as a teacher. I was getting some highly competitive publications in, in prominent journals. Um, I also just tend to get along with people around me. I, you know, and, and I'm finding myself loving every day. Um, and I saw myself here long term because I'm just enjoying it so much. And so part of that was like, so since I was loving it so much, I thought maybe I'd just make relationships with all the people in the department. Um, that said, some of those people who had been here around here longer than me um, sometimes gave me advice on how to flourish here at Whitworth. Usually it was unsolicited. And I feel like I have relatively good emotional intelligence and I'd spent time reflecting on, you know, which people model good research, who models good teaching and advising, et cetera. So I felt comfortable listening to advice and kind of taking it with a grain of salt. Also I have good mentors. So I, and I also knew that they were only trying to help uh, because they liked me and wanted to see me succeed. So everything's going great. Um, one day I'm sitting, in this chair in my office and an administrator, uh, a person of power, uh, not the dean, um, but somebody who had real ability to give punishments and rewards came into my office and shut the door. And they said, you know, person X, Y, Z, we heard they're trying to take you under their wing, but their advice is bad. Do not listen to anything they have to say And the tone felt really serious. And I was also kind of blindsided in the moment because there was no precursor to the conversation, just walks in and starts talking. That person was quiet for a minute and then asked if I had any questions. And I thought for a moment and realized I had a pit in my stomach. Uh, one of the things that's really beneficial to do is to notice your our own physical, um, emotional and behavior signs that we are flooded or that we're like have anxiety and I get a pit in my stomach when I'm anxious I have a physical sign some people get like a dry throat some people like their their shoulders get stiff some people like have physical behavior like they make themselves small or or maybe they make themselves look more aggressive it's just important to know recognize what your own signs of like unsafety are I had a pit in my stomach and and so I but then I said, you know, I've been hired to teach management and leadership here. Now I also teach marketing, but um, one element to my teaching is to focus on emotional systems and recognizing toxic triangles. And I said, I believe in this and I'm concerned that, that talking about this other person behind closed doors may actually perpetuate underlying problems. And so, and I asked, would you be willing to say the same things to me if that person was standing in the room with us? And I'm like terrified I'm, as I'm asking this question because I'm brand new hire, you know. And that person thought for a minute and said, actually that they would. I mean, in fact, are speaking with that person separately, um, but they were doing it separately to respect that other person's dignity and not shame them in front of a new hire, basically. Um, and so their response showed me that there was some health in the system. Um, uh, the discussion was delivered calmly and with clarity, um, and they were willing to really hear and consider my concern. But the big takeaway was that I may not have had the courage to speak up, you know, because the person had power, if I had not previously defined my own core values. You know, if things would have gone poorly, if I would have just got canned or, I don't know, something, um, 
I would have at least come out of that knowing I stuck to my convictions. But it was an opportunity for me to take a risk by asking a hard question to someone with positional authority over me. Uh, so, and in turn, it actually has led to people in the department seeking me out for advice in a lot of areas, um, in, in those areas. Um, so yeah, drawing on core, core values um, is, is huge. David, um, can, can I jump in with a question here? I'm super curious. Um, was, and you don't have to share, I mean, obviously I don't want you to share any more than you're comfortable with, but was the, so the, the, the third party came in and said, this person's giving you advice and I don't think you should take it. I think their, their advice isn't good. Was that actually, was that the truth? I mean, was that in reality, was it bad advice? I mean, you said the system was healthy because they heard you and that they were willing to have that conversation with this person in private. But I'm so curious, was like, like, was it actually bad advice? <laughs> um, I think if had I had I followed it very close to the T, I probably wouldn't have gotten tenured. Yeah. Wow. I I don't I hesitate to jump in. I always try to give all the focus to my speaker, but I have a very similar story that went a different path. Um, and it might help the conversation. I was hired at Comcast Spotlight. So I got my first real marketing job was at 49 degrees north. And I was laid off at the end of my second season there uh, because the, the recession was in full swing. And uh, if you know anything about 49, they've tried for you know 15 years to do some development up there. And at that time, um, they thought they were on their way and had made a lot of decisions that overextended uh, th them financially. And so I was, you know, I was the first casualty of that. And um, so I'm at the time I'm engaged, I'm about to be married. Um, I actually was between, this is so funny, I was between taking a job at Blockbuster as an assistant manager or going in, uh, into advertising sales at Comcast. And I chose advertising sales, uh, um, which you can argue was maybe not the right choice, even knowing where Blockbuster went. Anyway, we had a manager there that uh, it was an ancient system to say the least. And I found out after, I, and I was young, I was new and, and they, they had just switched into some new systems. And because I was young and new and knew my way around a computer, I picked those, those processes up really quickly. Uh, it was, you know, how, dealing with how to, how to get advertising schedules entered and, and how to do all of that. And, and as a result, some people, some of the sales staff that have been there like 10, 15 years were coming to me for advice. And like, how do I do this? And you know this better than I do. And, and there was some camaraderie that was being formed. I would pick their brains and, and they were asking me for help. And I, I found out later as this thing became very toxic to where I ended up leaving that, that they, those salespeople were actually pulled aside one day and told not to interact with me. Mm. And they were told that, that they, were, they needed to figure th stuff out on their own and that they needed to stop wasting my time. And then I, at the same time, was pulled aside and told, please stop helping. It, I was told to stop helping. And it, was, it took what was already an anxious system because we're now in the recession and we're trying to do advertising sales. And it just, it just leveled it up. And it was like, don't interact with people. You come here, you put your head down, you work. And it just, it was so toxic. And, and there's more I could say, but I just, like mine was the flip side where we were all told in private and then told to not do. And it was like, and it, it wasn't just positional authority. It was my direct boss. So I knew if I had, if I disobeyed that it would be, you know, I would be fired. Um, and I ended up walking out the door. They, they came to me and said one day, my manager and then my, my sales manager said, we don't think you're happy here. And I said, I don't think I am either. And I'm okay being done today. <laughs> and uh, so I walked out and called my wife. Hey, guess what happened? I just left Comcast. So anyway, I just, that's a, you know, the other side of that where it was an unhealthy system and it, there was no intention to get healthy. Yeah. There's so much in that story that I feel like, yeah. I mean, are there any, well, it sounds like, what were your core values in that, you know, that were challenged? How, what, was, what made it difficult for you to like, yeah, go ahead, Josh. I think... I mean, knowing, I, you know, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, or maybe just twenty forty. I wouldn't say I have a perfect idea of how to redo things. But looking back, um, so without taking too much time, what ended up happening, Comcast was a really great company in general to work for, despite what you might think of it. 
Um, but the office that we worked out of was very, very toxic. And every year Comcast does an employee survey. And the results from our office were so unique that they actually sent out a regional HR person to interview the staff um, without any managers on site. They actually made the managers leave the building. And they asked, you all reported, they said to us, they said, you all reported in the survey that you love Comcast as a company, but you all said you would not recommend working for this office and we need to know what's going on. And what we found was that all these other sales offices all had the same sales requirements and metrics that they were expected to meet similar to ours, but that ours is the only office that was towing the line 100% that wasn't giving grace or extending you know, any kind of leniency in certain areas. And it was basically everybody has to conform to the same set of metrics or you're out. And so herd mentality, quick fix thinking, a lot of reactivity, yeah. plane displacement. Yeah. And I look back at that and, and I think um, the only, I don't, my values at the time were just, I was so young and, and my value now is to serve others. I think my question would have been to my manager when I was asked to not engage, I would just ask, how does that help them as sales individuals? How does that help me as a sales individual? And how does that help the team? Like help me understand the thinking behind that decision so that I can better serve the team because I'm so focused now on just serving others that if I had known that that was my value back then, I think I would have asked that. How does that serve my clients? Like if I can't talk to my team and troubleshoot, how does that serve our clients? And, and I don't know that that would have changed the system, but I think that maybe would have saved me maybe what, what ended up being six to nine months of anxiety and anguish as I you know, tried to tough it out. Um, Becky just jumped in with something that I think is really timely. She said on Facebook, ancient systems and corporate environments are good at keeping employees in their place. Uh, sim she had a similar situation at a major nat national financial firm. It was a great company in values, but toxic leadership. And I think now also knowing that that leader, she, I think she ended up realizing she wasn't a good leader. She actually went back into just regular sales. And um, maybe just she wasn't equipped with the tools she needed. Uh, they actually did something similar to the Myers-Briggs personality testing when we were there. Um, and theirs was a color system. And uh, we all thought it was great because it showed us like how as a team, we all can interpersonally interact with one another better. The manager at the time took it to mean that now you all know how I am. And now you all know how to respond to me appropriately. And there was no, there was no, like, I'm going to change, right? It was just, you know, this is the way the system is. That, uh, that thought on Facebook is really good because when you think of chronically anxious systems, that one of the goals of a, uh, a system is to maintain stability. And so it will, you know, if these tenants of a chronically anxious system, those are all meant to maintain the status quo. So like, yeah, keeping employees in their place would be an example of that. Can I share a screen real quick? Cause I, I, I mean, it might be a little bit easier to see what kind of like summarize these tools. So yes, we've I was asking, please, please leave us with tools. Cause we've got about 20 minutes left. And if we don't figure out how to do this I think there's, you're gonna create an anxious system, Dave. <laughs> okay, so the first tool is to draw upon your own core values. And that's what gives you the courage to make difficult decisions to say difficult things. The second tool is to recognize when anxiety in yourself and in the system makes it more challenging to draw upon your core values, to lead with conviction. So in me, my heart rate increases. I get a pit in my stomach. Sometimes I stop breathing, like I actually hold my breath. Um, sometimes it's hard for me to come up with words. I, if, I'm, if I'm feeling flooded, I, I, I lose my ability to articulate my thoughts clearly. So um, I'll, just, I'll just share another workplace example. Um, I recently had to give some tough feedback to other folks. Um, it had to do with naming toxic patterns in a relationship system. So there was a relationship system and I was seeing triangling I was seeing uh, rigid negative views being held about each other in this system. 
I, I was seeing a lot of blaming and I, I was noticing a total lack of trust. And then in smaller groups within the system, I was seeing some hurting. Um, I was confident in what I had to say. Um, and I, I had done the work of, you know, mapping out worst case scenarios, you know, based on my fears, like what's the worst case scenario in terms of like, if I have this conversation, as well as alternative outcomes. Um, but I know that sometimes when I'm about to have a difficult conversation, I forget the words I plan on saying. So I just, I typed out a script, you know, it served as a tool for me to keep on track with the conversation and it helped me find the right words to articulate what I was seeing beforehand. And it allowed me to be honest, but also respectful at the same time. Um, you know, similarly, you know, in, when I'm teaching class, I, I tell stories and can lose track. Um, so I always type my notes. Um, I don't always need to read them right off the page, but they're there just in case I need them to keep me on track. Um, that, that gives me peace and it gives me confidence, which in turn allows me to be more present with those in the room. Um, you know, in other people, sometimes it's pressure to make a decision now. Dorothy was talking about like the quick fix mentality. Sometimes it's like, hey, I, we have this problem. What's the decision now if you're the leader, right? We need, to, we need an answer or to take sides. Um, so in this, you know, in this example, you know, I, I, I took a moment to breathe um, and, 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 I, and I just, I said, it was actually worked out really great because the meeting was on Zoom and I, and I said, I can't fix it. I don't, you don't want me to fix it, but there, there is triangling, there is a lack of trust. There is these things going on and I think I just had to name it. And then everybody went around there. Actually, it worked out amazingly because after that, they, they, they all, each person said, we see that those things are happening. And then they actually all spotlighted each other and, and then went around the room and, and talked about how they actually do enjoy working together. And, um, <clears throat> and it ended up being like kind of a first step of healing. But I had to recognize that my anxiety makes it more challenging for me. So I had to breathe slowly before the meeting. I had to type out my notes and that really helped. Um, Dude, can I share a story from the real world that kind of highlights what you're talking about in a different yeah. way? Um, so again, I feel like I'm doing too much talking, but um, so if you're, a, I, I'm a big football fan, watch a lot of Seahawks football. And if you were paying attention at all, you know that they were on pace to have one of the most historically bad defensive performances uh, in, in modern football history. Um, they were giving up something like 400 yards a game. The scoring was out of hand. And so for the first six games, it just looked like there was no way that they could, they could do uh, a postseason run or, or anything like that. And something ended up happening. Um, Ken Norton Jr., who, who I was even saying the Seahawks need to fire, is their defensive coordinator. So he's, he's in charge of those defensive players. Um, he held a Zoom meeting. And all he did was he just walked through plays, several plays, and then just asked, asked each of the players what their specific assignment should have been on that play. Where did you need to be? Where were you? And, and, and it just, it was a, a level of accountability, but because of the uniqueness of this season and the way that they're able to do coaching because of COVID, they were able to show the play and then just walk through and it just added a, a level of accountability just on a personal level. It took away all of that, that blaming and the hurting and the, it's this person's fault or it's, it just said, were you where you were supposed to be at that given moment? And if not, where did you need to be so that we can fix it? And they've now since if, if you're again, if you're, you've been paying attention in the last six, seven games, they have been the best, or if not the best, the second or third best defense in the league. And they all attribute it to that meeting, that it just helped them understand how that system is supposed to work when healthy. And I just, to me, the X's and O's of football just makes such a good, you know, a good analogy to this. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's really helpful to apply like concepts to multiple different types of systems, whether it's a family system, a workplace system, a sports team, because uh, they really 
kind of clarify. Yeah, that's really good. Here, I'm going to go back to sharing the screen again. Um, the second or the third one was understanding the, the crucial role of a leader's clarity, um, both in vision, vision, values, and principles, but how they play in calming an anxious system. Because people crave clarity, even when, especially when there's anxiety, and especially from leaders. You know, think about giving tough news, like you're laid off. If that decision is not clear, the anxiety swirls. Um, but if I know with clarity that I'm being laid off, then I can begin the coping process and start thinking about what's going to happen moving forward. So when a leader is good at communicating their vision, their core values, and guiding principles, the system tends to calm down because and become more thoughtful and better able to focus on and pursue the mission. Um, the, the next one is some, in the face of resistance and sabotage, you know, if we are gonna have to make a tough decision, stay the course, expect the sabotage and resistance and don't stay the course without feeling defensive or, or needing to win. <clears throat> so here's a kind of a, I, I typed up like a little business example so that I could remember how, how this could play out. So this is a fictional character. Jenny's hired by the board of an organization as CEO with a mandate to change culture from a highly soiled organization with too much internal competition, little collaboration and communication. So she decides to design an innovative office space where no one, not even senior leadership had their own private office space. And she creates this motto, no more closed doors. Uh, two members of her team had been voicing to everyone but Jenny, their dislike of the new plan saying pessimistically that they, that, that crazy idea will never work. And so, if she was gonna draw upon these tools, here's what she does. She does a self-differentiating move, making a tough decision that you believe to be the right one, even though others will disagree. Um, understanding that any self-differentiating move usually provokes sabotage by the less healthy, less differentiated parts of the system. Um, understanding that it always gets worse before it gets better because systems are designed to maintain the status quo, even when change is badly needed. Sabotage feels personal, so you might get hooked into reacting without pausing to notice your own anxiety. But rather than being emotionally reactive and just squashing the pessimists, she just calmly and firmly redefines her stance. She had to figure out what was a productive versus a reactive complaint, but she understands this, the tenets of chronic anxiety. And then so she responded to the productive ones, the ones that she felt like arised out of genuine interest to help, and then she asked the two to work together to collect employee concerns about the new plan and present her with possible solutions along with personal recommendations. So she makes it clear that she's open, what's open for consideration and what's not. So she sets her clear boundaries. And then in the end, she's able to accept enough of their recommendations that the other two found themselves invested in the success of the project. That's actually the Ben, uh, the ben Franklin effect. Um, I, teach this in my in my marketing classes and I have to I have to preface this one marketing class because I basically am teaching students how to manipulate behaviors of other people and there's like a big I mean we we talk about the use of play and advertising and how that like makes people more likely to like your product product purchase your product but we do it as parents like I turn I turn my you know, vegetables into airplanes so that my kids will eat their vegetables. It's, it's using play to manipulate a behavior. So, I mean, but we do have to talk about the, the, the morals and ethics of like using these tools. But um, the, the Ben Franklin effect is when Ben Franklin was first running for one of the low level offices, um, an opponent that he had, who he had never met, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but uh, had written this op-ed just totally scathing Ben Franklin, just totally criticizing everything about him. And um, what Ben Franklin did was he actually, instead of kind of getting defensive and criticizing back, he actually asked the guy if he could borrow one of his like books. And so the guy obliged, he borrowed the book and, and then he wrote it, Ben Franklin wrote a nice note in it, gave it back after he read it. And in the end, that relationship was repaired and the guy became one of his most trusted advisors. The, the, 
the psychology behind it is we think that if you if I do you a favor, or if you do me a favor, let's see here. It's it's counterintuitive. Um, if you do me a favor, if I if I ask you for a favor, you are actually gonna like me more than if I just do you a favor. Because if I ask you for a favor, you're gonna be more invested in my goals because you've actually participated in, in working with me towards some kind of goal. And so this is what this you know, fictional character Jenny does is she asks these people to participate with her in the mission of creating a culture of openness and communication. So I guess the key takeaway of that is just to stay persistent in the face of sabotage and recognize when it's sabotage versus helpful feedback. Um, does, would anybody else be willing to share a time when they, you know, had, had to make a bold, a difficult decision and they stayed the course, drew upon their core values or? Our audience has dwindled a little on the Zoom, although there's still quite a few people on Facebook, so you might just have to jump in and share a story. Well, I mean, I, those were my two stories, the one where, where my supervisor came into my office and then the other where I had to give some feedback to others. Um, that's okay. We only have a couple of minutes left. Maybe we can jump into the, we didn't really talk about uh, social skill, but it's a, I would say it's like, uh, you know, the first, the first two emotional intelligence tenants um, are, you know, you know, self-awareness and self-regulation are self-management skills. Um, motivation is, you know, is different, but the last two, empathy and social skill, have to do with your relationship with other people. And social skill is described as friendliness with a purpose of moving, moving people or leading them in some direction, um, finding some kind of common ground uh, with people of all kinds. Um, oftentimes, it, one way to help, when I teach this in, in class, I ask students to think of the person in their life that they like, that they dislike the most. And then I and then I ask them to take a minute to just think about, reflect on, discover what's one redeeming quality of that person. Um, I remember when I was in my MBA and I was in a leadership class, and the instructor would. It was very. It felt ironic because the instructor would ask a question of the class, call on somebody to answer it, and if they got the answer wrong, he kind of belittled them in front of the whole class. It was so. This was like this. The person in my mind who I felt like was the person I disliked, you know, and then I just had all these negative feelings about him. One day I saw him at Chaps, the restaurant um, here in Spokane, and I, with his family, and I saw him with his young daughters and how tender he was with them. And I, it, what it did for me is it turned him back into a human from the monster that I had created him to be. And so I think it's a really good exercise in terms of finding ground is to try to discover some rede redeeming quality of the person you don't like. And social skill doesn't mean that people are just necessarily social butterflies, but people who have a lot of social skill in terms of emotional intelligence understand that the most important work rarely gets done alone. So they're also skilled at persuasion. Um, so they know when to make an emotional appeal, when to make a rational appeal, which one's more appropriate. You know, in advertising is rational appeals are better when you're trying to persuade someone to make that your product or service or brand is the best choice among alternatives. So a, a rational appeal would focus on practical, functional or utilitarian need for a product or service. Um, and in advertising, an emotional appeal works when you're trying to influence either social or psychological attitudes about a product. Um, in psychology, a rational appeal, if you, in political psychology, a rational appeal um, works better for um, strengthening 
your constituents that already agree with you and an emotional appeal is better in swaying opinions. Um, um, sometimes in terms of social skill, it shows itself in ways that other emotional intelligence dimensions don't. So people with social skills may be perceived as, you know, you, people who have high self-awareness, high self-regulation, who are highly motivated, empathetic, um, those are always, almost always seen as really positive traits. Sometimes people with social skill are perceived as not working well at work, but schmoozing. Um, perhaps I've seen joking with people who aren't directly connected to their actual jobs. But the key here is that socially skilled people build wide bonds because they understand they may, may need their help later from someone who they're just getting to know today. Um, so in contrast with other EQ components, it's considered, actually social skill is considered a key leadership quality in most companies. Um, but I'll just say social skills is one of those things that allows other people to put their emotional intelligence to work. And if you're like me, the idea of going into a large room with a bunch of people I don't know sounds terrifying. Um, I can't, I'm, I'm not the type of person who just thrives in that environment. But what I have found out through self-reflection is I do much better if I have a purpose. Um, and so if I have a job to do, so then I'm, I'm much better at connecting with people I don't know. Um, and so even at the beginning of this, little seminar, we asked a personal question. And one of, and, and I think, you know, the, the most memorable meal, I feel like I know each person who answered that question a little bit better. Because not, not because I know what you ate, but because I know what really stuck out to you. I, I, I know a little bit more about what was meaningful in that important lifetime experience. And so with that, you know, I've, tried to make a bank of questions that you can ask just about anybody um, that gets beyond, hi, I'm David, this is my job title, what do you do? You know, that's, I mean, that's not interesting to me as much. Um, I, I really like asking questions like, do you have any siblings? What was it like growing up with two, two sisters? You know, and then, then it allows them to, to re really a relationship to be formed. So if I were to say, suggest like one exercise for building social skill, I would say, come up with questions that you can ask any person in any scenario that go beyond surface level questions that show that you actually care about who they are and not just what they do. So I think we ran out of time though. Well, I was gonna say on that note, I wanna jump in. So I have a couple things that I have found, some research that I found to be super helpful uh, in, in this arena as I've tried to grow and develop um, as an individual. Uh, the first one is a book called Boundaries by uh, Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. Um, they're both, uh, I believe psychologists, they could be psychiatrists, I always get it confused. Um, I will say uh, it is a faith-based book, so do anticipate that there will be scriptures and, and stories that come from the Bible, but also know that they are, also, they are pr practitioners, um, so they use a lot of, you know, proven theory from, um, you know, a mental health perspective, and as, as people were talking today, and David, as you were sharing, I was jumping in chat talking about some of those things and some of the concepts that I learned from there. When you said boundaries isn't, you know, leaving boundaries is where I begin, where I end and you begin. I was reminded of a story he tell that they tell that he was dealing with a patient in, in a session and the patient was really frustrated with his wife because his wife was asking him to do all this work and all these projects and all this stuff around the house. And he felt like he never had a, a, a spare free moment. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the gentleman saying, it's not that I don't want to do these things for my wife, but I also would like to do things for myself. And so the, the, whichever, whether it was Cloud or Townsend uh, pressures him to say, well, okay, how much time would you be willing to give to your wife? And he says, well, I'd be willing to give, you know, X number of hours per week. And then they said, well, okay, so now you need to approach her with that. And so that I think is a really great story that just highlights what you're talking about when confronting a broken system, you're not going to it and say like, I'm not willing to work within this. You're saying I'm willing to do some things 
but I'm only willing to do this much. And they did say to him, you need to anticipate that she's not going to handle it well, but that the result will be she knows there's a new way to treat you and a new way to interact with you. Um, so I love the book boundaries. And then the other one uh, that I have found really helpful is the five dysfunctions of a team. And um, although I'm reading on Wikipedia that there were some criticisms of it, but I do, I, I thought it highlighted the five things that can go wrong and gave a really practical parable on how to deal with that if you are a leader of a team that's dysfunctional and what you might do to, to shift course. Um, so on that note, we are at our time. David, thank you so much for joining us today. This was just outstanding. I was a little concerned about what kind of an audience we would draw today. Um, I, I will tell you, this is again, one of the most popular ones already. Uh, a lot of people joined on Facebook. We had quite a few people join us on Zoom. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who are new to us this, uh, this month, we try to do Business Brew first Thursday of the month at 8 a.m. Uh, in the next few days, probably by early next week, I will have a video of this posted on YouTube. And I will also have a blog that summarizes uh, the points that David brought up. So David, please save that Word document and send it to me so that I can use that for the basis of my blog. Uh, and then uh, wherever you are, please just in your, in your hearts and minds, give David a round of applause. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone who participated in the conversation this morning. And on that note, I'll let you all go. David, if you don't mind hanging on, we can chat. Uh, as, as people sign off. Thanks so much for having me. So great to see you guys.